Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always watch our archives um, at your uh, convenience. The show is recorded every week, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can find all of our um, archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries. So uh, we provide training and support and uh, grants uh, to all types of libraries across the state. So you will find things on our show that are for public libraries, K-12s, uh, academics, museums, correction facilities, anything that is um, has a library. Uh, so really the only criteria for the kind of things we have on the show is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, something libraries are doing, something cool things we think they sh could be doing. Um, we have libraries themselves come on and share some cool, fun things they're doing, um, innovative things, and um, we sometimes share resources that we would like them to um, know about um, from the Nebraska Library Commission. So we have a mixture of things, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, small demos of products and services. It's really all over the place, uh, but that's good. <laughs> Uh, we sometimes have sessions that are um, done by Nebraska Library Commission staff, uh, particularly for things that we're offering here through this through the um, state. Uh, we bring in libraries, but we also bring in guest speakers from all across the country. And that's what we have this morning with us on the line here is John. Good morning, John. Hey, Krista. How are you today? Hi. Um, and you're up in Chicago, I believe? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I I'm off the road for a change. I'm, I'm in my uh, sparkling home office right now. Surprise. Enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. And um, he is from every library, as you can see in the slides there, and he's going to talk to us about uh, what we can do to support libraries in 2020. Uh, so I'm just going to hand it over to you, John, to take it away and uh, introduce yourself and every library and um, what you have for us today. Absolutely, Krista. Thank you so much. It's nice to be on Encompass Live. Uh, I, I, I check in not every single Wednesday, but when I do, it's really very valuable. Um, one of the things that we like to be able to do here at Every Library and the Every Library Institute is give folks a, a bit of a master's class on the data around voter attitudes that drives a lot of decision making. Whether it's in Nebraska where you have a unicameral legislation, legislator and you don't necessarily go out for the vote, uh, all the way to Illinois, my home state, where about half the libraries have voter facing initiatives, meaning that they have to actually talk to the voters directly to get their, their budgets approved or their buildings built, uh, to a place like uh, California, uh, where uh, you pretty much have to do a super majority to get that to happen as well. Whether it's a negotiation with the city council, a county government, the town board, whether it's a, uh, a, a parcel tax, a millage, a warrant article, there's a lot of different names for it, but what we work on here at every library is the funding for the library and the staffing, whether it's public uh, or school libraries as well. Let me take you through a little bit about who we are in case uh, this is a, a, a bit of a 101 for you about what's up. We've got two parts to the Every Library family of organizations. One is there are, for the last seven years, we've been working as a political action committee through Every Library. It's a 501c4. And C4s are different than C3s in a very substantial way. C4s are technically super PACs. Um, we are the only national super PAC for libraries. As a super PAC, we can raise and expend unlimited funds to advance our nefarious special interests. Uh, we, you're, you're our nefarious special interests. Congratulations. I don't know if you've ever been one before, but it's kind of satisfying to feel that way. Um, we've done a lot of work over the years um, with those local, state, and also nationally on engaging voters, engaging the public, engaging constituents of elected officials in the discussion around what it takes to fund library services, what it takes to make sure that librarians are staffing either the community's library or the campus library in K-12. That C4 structure is appropriate to election day. It's appropriate to a budget negotiation day with a recalcitrant city council or a town board that hasn't really understood what libraries are doing or a city council that's really disconnected from, from what we are up to. 
We also have the Everlibrary Institute, which is our new 501c3. We started it at the beginning of 2019 in order to, well, do one or two really big things. One of those big things is to do research uh, around the voter attitudes and around the public attitudes, and not just in that snapshot kind of way, but also to figure out what the messaging is. I, I know more about what's happening in some small towns around the country than we do nationally as an organization or as a profession or as an industry about what's in the hearts, heads, or guts of the voters or the constituents of elected officials. So the, the Institute is designed to, to build up a corpus of information and research as a charitable, as a nonprofit organization. The other component of what we do is we talk about political literacy and train folks on how to be politically literate. Um, political literacy is, well, you boil it all down to sugar. It's where do you, where's my money come from and how do I get more of it? Uh, I need more positions in the school district. How do I do that? The work that we do on the C3 side is donor supported and grant supported in a similar way, uh, but different than how it is donor supported on the C4 side. Uh, back to the C4, every library, the super PAC, all of our work here on all of those campaigns is pro bono and is donor supported, meaning that we do it for free for the library and for the, the political campaign. On the C3 side, uh, we are a, um, a, a, a peer in the ecosystem uh, of advocacy and of research work. Let me get into the master's class for you a little bit about what we know about about voters these days um, and a lot of everything that we do around a engagement with the voters or constituents of elected officials has to be driven by data and our data profile as i said before is a little bit poor um, it also the data that we have largely comes from pew uh, the pew charitable trusts and oclc uh, and they're two different uh, from awareness to funding surveys um, I, like I said, I know a lot more about particular towns because we've done the polling work in those towns to ask people what they believe, what they value, what their value system is, and how it relates to the library and the librarians. But let me start with what we already know nationally because it's a little troubling. Well, there's some civic attitudes. This is from Pew 2016, their libraries survey. Um, it was a comprehensive uh, conversation with the American public uh, at large. Uh, Pew does amazing work. In fact, I would highly recommend you Googling up the words uh, Pew 2016 and libraries and reading the entire corpus that they've developed around civic and social and, and public attitudes about libraries. It's three years old now, but it's, I hope, st hopefully it's still holding. Yes, it's good to know that there's millennials that like libraries and use them. Parents are more likely to use libraries. This is kind of like the background radiation, folks. This is not a deep dive. What we have, though, from Pew is a very interesting conversation about what people believe about libraries and not about their use. What they believe about libraries and librarians and not about their use of the library. When asked, uh, well, what, you know, what do you believe about what libraries do and who librarians are? What, what, what do you guys do all day for a living? Uh, folks around the country were told the Pew Charitable Trusts that, well, number one, that what libraries do is provide a safe space for people to spend their time. That, and that, that's really fantastic. And, and I got to tell you, me personally, John Kraska, hi, nice to see you. I'm presenting today. I don't need the safe space. I, 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 I mean, I'm talking from my home office right now. I have a certain amount of privilege and I don't need that personally. I'm glad that it's being provided though. Creating educational opportunities for people of all ages, lovely. Helping spark creativity among young people, that's probably a good thing. Providing a trusted place for people to learn about new technologies, folks. I don't need it. I'm glad that the library is doing it, but I can build a bridge over the digital divide on the devices that my own children have either lost or broken. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being flip. Like, I don't need this service from you, but what about those other kids? Or what about those other people? There's a lot in here while promoting a sense of community, helping people decide what information they can trust, fake news, helping people seek health information. Folks, I have insurance, I'm fine. 
So this is not about me. In, in a lot of the main here, it's not about me by the respondents either. It's what do you see the library doing for other people? And that other people part here means that if we're telling them that you will get on election day, if you will get when city council or county government finally does their job, that you will get when you make a donation, we're disconnected from what people's hearts, heads, and guts are. What you see here is a laundry list of values that people have, value system, deeply held beliefs that we should be taking care of each other in some way, shape, or form. This is not a set of features that they utilize. In fact, when, when Pew's survey came out, this was a very interesting uh, set of responses here. People were asked around the country, statistically significant survey of the American public, would closing the public library hurt you or your community? Now, 33% of Americans said it would, it would hurt, it would be a major negative impact on me or the people I love my, the most, my family. 33%. And the industry kind of freaked out when that came out. I don't know if you remember this or not, but people said, oh my God, only 33% of Americans would suffer if the local library closed personally or their family would suffer, we have to get that number up to 50%. We got to work on getting more people in the door. And yet 66% of Americans believe, believe in their hearts, their head, and their gut. They have a value system. They have a personal belief system that says there would be a major negative impact on the community. I don't see this as a problem that, well, people like me, People like other voters or donors or volunteers, people who are, there's a well of compassion here. 33% of Americans having a personal major negative impact, that's fine. 66% saying there but for the grace of God go I. 33% of people saying, oh, I, you know what, it would be a problem for me. The other 33% saying it kind of would be, the other one saying I don't even need it, I don't even use it. And yet 66, well, 66 plus 25 percent, I don't know who those 6 percent are who think there's no impact on their community, what callous individuals those are, but the rest of the American public is a depth of compassion, and it's a depth of interest, and there's a lot of nostalgia about what you're doing, especially for those folks who haven't been in in a long time. Okay, this is really fascinating because the folks who've been in in a long time, library users in the past year, of course, there's more negative impact on them. 48% say that there would be a major negative impact on the users, of users. And only 19%, or in, sorry, 19% say there would be a minor. Of the uh, ne never been to the library, they look at it as an impact on the community as a whole. It's fascinating to me. It covers both users and non-users in the majority. It means that when they drive by, they see the parking lot's full and think everything's fine. They actually think everything's fine. They think that you're doing something right now as a non-user. They think you're doing something right now that matters. And we should be working on ways to support that. All right, let me switch gears. Pew, uh, that was Pew, again, Pew 2016. Uh, Google it up, libraries, don't read it for before bed. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, from 2018's uh, OCLC's From Awareness to Funding survey. Now the difference between what OCLC did and what Pew did is that OCLC asked questions of voters. So the first question on the survey essentially was, are you a registered voter? If you said yes, then you could take the survey. If you said no, they'd kick you out because we don't care what you're thinking about because we're talking about taxes. So From Awareness to Funding, again, this is the background radiation. 55% look at libraries as a, an essential institution. They think you advance education, a source of community pride, you enhance quality of life. And folks, the background radiation is kind of soft. We're within the margin of error on 50%. And you got places like California that need 66.7% to pass a measure. The, the, the softness of the background radiation, things have slid over the last 10 years. Let me show you something here. This is uh, uh, interesting troubling back in 2008 remember the dear dead days of long ago 2008 uh, 2008 was uh, pre obama pre recession pre occupy wall street pre tea party pre trump for sure ancient in <laughs> i'm sorry 
Ancient history. Ancient history. Back in 2008, 37% of voters would definitely vote yes for the library. 37% would likely vote yes for the library. You do the math, that's 74%. And things were not uh, always winning back in 2008 even, um, but there was a lot of support. 26% of Americans back in 2008 were terrible humans. Now, it's changed a lot. This is 2018 now. Let me toggle back. 2008, 2018, 27% today. Well, just before today, a little bit towards the end of last year, would definitely vote yes for the library. Let's drop 10 points from 37% down to 27%. And only 31% of Americans are likely to vote for the library now. And this survey methodology that OCLC used is bulletproof. It's tight, it's good. Again, I would really encourage you to read both the 08 and the 18 to understand where the snapshot of attitudes is. And understand that 42% of our neighbors are likely or definitely gonna vote no. Now you can cut that in half, about 21% of folks are suspicious of the library and 21% are anti-tax. The 27% at the top are those believers. And that 31% in the middle, they have some legitimate questions. Where's my money gonna go? Who's gonna spend my money? Sure. Why do we need libraries? Everything's on the internet? Absolutely. All right, this is what happened over the last 10 years. And we have to be working on this as an industry because it's where our money comes from. This is voters directly supporting measures of the ballot. This is constituents of elected officials in cities and counties and state government, national government, federal government. This is folks who are in some way, shape or form inclined to volunteer and donate to a certain extent. As a percent of the population in 2008, we had a lot more people who believed. 7.1% down to 6.5% over, over the last 10 years. That is not I mean, it's six cents of a percentage point on, on seven points. It's within the margin of error. And yet I'm really worried about that because there used to be 80% of those people would vote yes. Now it's down to 64% and their user habits haven't changed. They're still doing 15.9 visits a year. And they rate libraries more positively now than they did 10 years ago. This is the most fascinating part to me. And they also look at librarians in basically the same way. In a, in a very positive way. They love the library. They think you're doing transformational work and they're not gonna pay for it because they've they've gotten their, their feelings about a progressive tax policy to fund the common good disrupted by the rest of society. If our metric here is that, well, you know, if our, if our advocacy work has been to make people rate libraries more positively, we have succeeded wildly. If over the last 10 years, our, metrics about what makes advocacy successful is that somebody's going to vote for us that's gone down probable supporters those folks who are like i have some questions i have some questions where's every why is everything i'm sorry why do we need libraries everything's on the internet where's my money going to go what's happening as a percent of the population those probable supporters for us have fallen we saw it before it's moved from down to the bottom level a segment that would vote yes for the library has fallen by 11 percentage points the number of visits has gone down as well, but that's not a key driver necessarily because we're talking about post-recession and they still look at libraries just as positively. One troubling point though is that they start rating librarians a little less positively. Uh oh. Yeah. yeah, I want to dive into that for a minute. Interesting, yeah. Well, there's two parts of this here. One is that so in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, where every library helped uh, Scott and his team um, on a citywide election day for the library, it was new funding for the library. After the riots, they, they, they got donations in from around the, around the world. Um, and they used those donations very, very prudently to improve the building, improve the collection, improve, this, improve, improve the services to the community. And then the donations were running out, so they needed to go for a ballot measure. We polled there using good, you know, polling techniques in the community and found out that 82% of people love the library, another 16% like the library, and only 42% would vote yes for it. In Ferguson, Missouri, where the only functioning unit of government was the library. 
So we spent two years working with Scott and his team on changing, uh, well, essentially engaging voters uh, and engaging people's value systems and updating them on what needs to get, uh, well, how do we spend some money, smart tax money, to fund this common good. Let me get to the image of the librarian part problem here, though. Over the last 10 years, an OCLC for Mornings to Funding 2018 discovered that over the last 10 years, we have lost ground on the image of the librarian. It used to be 2008, uh, folks thought 67% of folks thought uh, librarians were friendly and approachable. Now it's only 53%, and I want to find out what you people did to them. Because seriously, how can we have gone down that many points in 10 years? But, yeah. I mean, it, they looked at us, looked at us, 56% looked at librarians, not us. I'm not a librarian by trade. I've never worked in a library. I don't pretend to be a librarian. They're, as true advocates for lifelong learning, it's down to 46%, and that's a core function of our advocacy campaigns. That we're knowledgeable about our communities is down. That you understand the community's needs is down. It has excellent computer skills is down. Well, that might be because other people's computer skills have come up. But that said, well known in the community is hovering around 30%. When was the last time we got out from behind the reference desk? When was the last time we got out from behind the circ desk? And I know that you're understaffed and overworked, and I get it. When was the last time we put the name of somebody who recommended the books in that Facebook post about new books, new mystery books? When was the last time we put somebody's name in that? So acknowledge the fact that there's some librarian behind that decision. Mm -hmm. When was the last time that we put the name of a librarian? in the post that's the story time 10 a.m bring your kids because i know miss karen loves your kids we've got to work on confronting this and one of the things that we do in every single campaign that we're, we're working on is confronting both the slide and voter support for taxes and the image of the librarian well the metaphor that we use is the librarian is candidate because they are because people are like hey not just where's my money going to go but they're going to ask the question of who's going to spend my money. And if we're down at that 31% level, we got some trouble. All right. In the data, this again, this is the OCLC data from Awareness to Funding 2018 and 2008. Uh, I, please download it. You can get the full tables. They've done a beautiful job. We would not have started every library as a political action committee if it was not for OCLC and the 2008 from Awareness to Funding survey because of these discoveries. And it came out in 2008. We didn't get every library started until the end of 2012 because it wasn't being acted on otherwise. Political party doesn't matter. Political party doesn't matter in whether somebody is a believer at that 31% or questioner asking the, the hard questions of where's my money going to go? Who's going to spend my money? Why, where, why do I need libraries anymore? Everything's on the Internet. Political party doesn't matter if you're one of the suspicious people in town about taxes because there's a lot of good reasons to be suspicious about taxes. And the only place that it matters is if you put an asterisk next to somebody who's a card carrying member of like the Tea Party, and that's that bottom, bottom 21%. Card statistics in a town don't matter. Card statistics in a town don't matter is fascinating to me because we, we, we tend to look at card statistics as a proxy for people's uh, support for us, when in fact the taxes are the proxy that people have for their compassion. The statistics from the cardholders don't matter one bit. It's whether or not they understand that 66% of people plus 25% who are like, don't close the library because it would harm the other, who say thank you to the librarians. Well, only if we, only if we put ourselves in a position to be thanked. The last part of the OCLC data that's fascinating to me is that library use doesn't matter as to whether or not you're in that believer category, questioning category, suspicious category, or the any tax is a bad tax, never going to vote for you, never philosophy of government category. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to challenge all of you who are librarians who sit on the RA desk or the CERC desk or out in front at all to think about your, your, your guys named Gary and Steve. And Gary and Steve, your conspiracy theory dudes, like my mom, Betty, uh, you've never met Betty unless you have, and she's fantastic. Betty's retirement job, she used to work for Lions Clubs International. She works at the Berwyn Public Library, my hometown library right now, on Thursdays and Saturdays. If you want to meet Betty, come into Berwyn, Illinois, Thursdays and Saturdays, Berwyn Public Library. And you have to, like, wait for her to finish talking to these guys who I'm going to call Gary and Steve. Tell her uh, John sent you. <laughs> 
Tell her John sent you. Exactly. <laughs> why you're there. <laughs> she knows more about Gary and Steve. It's like a HIPAA violation for her to go to work. You know, like she knows a ton about Gary and Steve because they talk to her all day long. Um, yeah. And then when they leave, they give her their manifesto about, well, somebody's birth certificate or how the government's, you know, putting tinfoil on our heads. Um, these dudes are in the library all the time and they ain't never going to vote for Betty because they have a philosophy of government that's entirely different. Also, a lot of users, this country is littered with libraries named after families that are too wealthy to use the place. Mm -hmm. There are book stacks, just piles of books with book plates, I should say, that are named in honor of people or by people who are too wealthy to, they got a Netflix account, they're cool, they use Amazon, whatever. You might be their book barista, but what you're doing for other people is massively impactful. All right, so what does matter? Two things. Two big things. One is the value system that the voters have. The value system. Like I said before, the, the, the beliefs that Pew enumerated, clean, well-lighted place, no fear, no favor, everyone can come in, will we'll help you get what you need, technology, books, um, the, 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 the discovery of self. It's not about the ROI for the individual. It's about what the, what the I'm sorry, let me rephrase. It's not about the ROI for the, for the voters in general, it's the ROI for the community together. So the value system, the deeply held beliefs that people have, and quite honestly, the perception of the librarian. Because that top tier of supporter, those truly top tier of supporter, they still love librarians as much as they did 10 years ago, and they wanna see you behaving in that way that is a proxy for their compassion. There's a big difference between voter engagement and advertising. There's a big difference between marketing and advertising as well. But voter engagement is where we spend a lot of our time, all of our time, because we need to talk to people who are gonna actually punch a chad. We need to talk to people who are gonna uh, pick up a, the phone and call a member of Congress. We need to talk to people and engage the, the folks who are gonna send that petition to that county commission and city council. We have to engage them in a way that is not just pushing an ad at them. And it is certainly not about building users because the user status doesn't matter at all. And that goes two ways. One is if you say to somebody, we have a program that'll help you personally bridge the digital divide and they don't need it, it means that they're not gonna listen because all you're doing is trying to sell them a feature as opposed to saying to them and engaging with them that says, we have programs for other people that help them bridge the digital divide, that help them learn first language, that help their, their kids get a, a leg up, you know, and actually help the parents too. You don't need it personally, but let me tell you what we did for those folks and what the funding that we have does to help those folks out. Let me engage you as a voter in a value system that we're putting to work that we know we share. There are eight big heart heartwarming, those heartwarming type stories are the ones that really get people. Well, it's more than a story. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Because yes. it's not just about the, the one person that we affected. It's about the ability to say, I did this work and we need these resources. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute because it's an important element of, of engagement. Um, and it's a, is it the, unfortunately, Kristen, we've been doing kind of advocacy wrong over the last, I don't know, 25 years, mm -hmm. because we keep telling stories as if somebody's going to pop up as an advocate for us, like a mushroom, after we tell the story. All right, let me hit this real quick. There's eight reasons that libraries lose. And we know this from working on hundreds of library campaigns around the country. Uh, with 109 election days behind us, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When the day of the vote is the first time that people see the plans, that's about marketing and engagement. There's a lot of focus in this list around any taxes of bad tax groups or local elected officials who are opposed or watchdogs or their personal opposition or how the community is changing. There might be some zero sum gaming game going on. Fundamentally though, basically the problem for libraries is that there's no engagement. There's tactical issues like that one elected official who's a real problem or an anti-tax group that might, but in the main, we have a problem in talking with a full voice about who we are as libraries, what we do as librarians, 
and the funding that gets behind it that either needs to be stable or needs to be increased. The engagement is where um, we tend to see trouble. People think that you run a stealth campaign for new money, you can't anymore. There is a lot of noise in that list of why libraries lose, but it, the lack of engagement, the lack of marketing, and the reliance simply on advertising to build use is killing us. In fact, it's killing us so bad. OCLC did one more study. This is not part of the From Awareness to Funding study. This is part of a uh, marketing to build, uh, the, the survey of marketing they did in 2018. I, I, I have to put a better footnote on here next time. That said, they asked people who do marketing for libraries and communications for li libraries, what is your desired outcome for your communications efforts? And despite the fact that 90% of our funding, 94% of our funding comes from the will of local voters or the will of, of politicians, it's to build community awareness or increase use of library materials. Despite the fact that the user status of the voter, the user status of the constituent doesn't matter, we're looking for more people to show up at library events and to increase traffic. Mm -hmm. When I personally, as a voter or constituent, don't need what you're selling me, but I'm really, well, if you told me that you did it for somebody else, and how much it costs, and what your competency is as a librarian in doing it, I, I, I could be engaged. The current library advocacy model is something that we're really troubled by in, in here at Every Library. We're, we're working against it, quite honestly. Uh, the current library advocacy model is sales, and it's advertising, and it's a push. Um, it is uh, take this action when they actually ask for actions. Uh, but usually it's 10 a.m. story time. Bring your kids. Look, a kid got a kid. A kid's now can read. There's a problem with that model. There's a problem with that model because let me let you read the the cartoon. There's a problem with that model because we don't actually know how people feel about what we've done. Hmm. We don't give them a chance to to respond and to engage back. And we have a, an undifferentiated series of audiences. We, we basically have like five audiences in, in library lands, like kids, teens, uh, seniors, uh, genealogy, and then whatever your special collection is. Um, we have a lot more value system out there in the community. Who else cares in the community about literacy? That one's an easy one. Or education, that one's pretty natural. But what about business development and support for small businesses, entrepreneurs, side gigs? How many people care that your technology, that your computers are the gateway to like the global market for people who are consultants or, or, or self-starters or looking to start a business? How many other people care about the whole life of a child that isn't necessarily about literacy, but they could see it as part of the whole cloth? How many people care about, I mean, you can keep going with all your service provision points. We have to ask them to do two things. One is to take an action based on their value system if they care. And the other is to self-identify what they care about. All right, so this is the last piece of the From Awareness to Funding. I think I said that twice already. But in From Awareness to Funding 2018, they uh, did something uh, that I think is, is, is fundamental and we need to pay attention to in this industry. The word identify here at the top was in brackets because my colleague Patrick Sweeney put that on. We have to identify, cultivate, and empower super supporters. Those folks who are in that 6.6%, um, that those folks who believe in libraries the most, who believe in librarians the most, and who are soft right now, and their willingness to pay for it. The segment's loyalty should not be taken for granted, but rather nurtured and protected. In addition, library leaders can consider how to engage and leverage this group as library ambassadors. Folks, we're, we're, we're doing this every day here at every library on these local campaigns and these state level and regional level initiatives that we're supporting and nationally as well. And we're looking to take it to a new scale this year coming up in 2020. Our approach with local campaigns at every library, again, it's 109 election days. We've supported dozens of negotiations with city councils and county governments and town boards. We run the Save School Librarians Initiative uh, mm -hmm. with support from Follett on well, turning around some of the problems in districts and schools, confronting when a, when a school librarian's job is cut or an entire department gets eliminated. We're focusing in each of these places 
uh, at the local level, whether it's a single zip code or a single school district, on the legitimate needs that have been identified by the local leaders for the library. And we're helping them build a, uh, a campaign to engage the people who care also. Likewise, at the state and regional level, we've been working on this from a values system approach. That we've got great partnerships going on right now with many of the state library associations and the state school library associations because they are the legitimate local stakeholders for the funding formula for libraries in that state and the policy formula or the, the policy uh, environment for, for libraries in their states. And it's based on seeing who else cares? Because quite honestly, the policies are very particular and necessary for the libraries. And very and the funding formula is very important for state library, library systems and co-ops and individual libraries. And yet the voters and the constituents in that state are really driven more by their value system of what, who librarians are and what libraries do. Likewise, our national voter engagement has been uh, focusing on well, so far, so good with every library, and we're trying to get a little bit bigger in 2020. And this is one of the cool things about why we wanted to chat today, is because we're already at around 342,000 people on social media. I checked, Krista, just before we started. Uh, that's uh, our Facebook plus our Twitter. Mm -hmm. We have about 155,000 people who are committed library supporters in our database today. And I mean committed because they've taken more than one action. And they've done something to put their value system to work. It might be appealing uh, in, uh, to a, um, a county commission when they've made some cuts. It might be supporting or signing a pledge to, to uh, support school librarians. Again, it's to help with that national, the, the national picture where the states are the ones spending the funding that comes from the federal government. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do with, with uh, a, a big lift next year though is to move into a national voter engagement campaign to move beyond or to take what we've got the competencies that we have with these local campaigns out of those 109 campaigns we've had uh, 90 wins we've helped secure over 1.7 billion dollars in stable tax funding for libraries over the next 20 years it's about 332 million dollars a year if you put together all the small ones and all the big ones that's um, amazing yeah yeah no it's it's a fantastic number and we're only touching about 10% of the campaigns at any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, Libraries 2020, hopefully, Libraries 2020 is going to shift gears uh, and move into, well, you, you, got, you got Trump 2020, you got Warren 2020, you got Buttigieg 2020, you got, well, Libraries 2020 could, if we get the funding that we need, essentially build the, uh, the library party in the United States. Um, I'd like to see a national library party. Now, it's not like England. We're, we're working in England right now with the uh, British Library Association, SILIP, on a I national saw it. I was there recently. Yeah? It's yeah. A, it's a fantastic uh, campaign to build public engagement and support for libraries across England and eventually the UK. We're running uh, Vote Libraries UK right now uh, in advance of the general election over there. They could actually have a library party. They got the Labor, they got they got the Tories, they got the Lib Dems, they got the Greens. They could have a library party. Mm -hmm. We're not suggesting it's going to be the same as over there, but there's a whole group of people who would like to self-identify as being supportive of libraries and, well, uh, engage with librarians. So Libraries 2020 is is intended to be a integrated digital and real world campaign to talk to more than 342,000 people that we already have. We'd like to get to about three to 5% of the American public. Uh, three to 5% of the American public is a, well, we're, we're talking about Greenpeace numbers, NRA numbers, Sierra Club numbers, human rights campaign numbers. Mm -hmm. And you see what policy change looks like when you look at three to 5% of the American public supporting second amendment rights or supporting gay marriage supporting fight for 15 minimum wage or recreational marijuana you see these numbers around three to five percent of the american public we think we can get there Indeed, yeah it would be huge mm. but we're looking at focusing the library's 2020 campaign not just on fund not just on awareness but on funding awareness you can't measure funding you can take to the bank and you can hire more librarians 
you can buy more books, whether they're ebooks or, or, or print. You can have the databases that, that support the curriculum in schools or support business development in communities. We are looking at Libraries 2020 as being very, very engaged in both public and school library issues, and that it's about, well, that, that, that top tier of folks in our hearts uh, who have us in their hearts, their heads, and their guts as well. Um, we have a big fundraising goal, Krista, on, on Giving Tuesday, and I'm just letting people know about it because this is not going to be a cheap campaign. We would like to actually run a national library campaign with enough money behind it to do things. And digital here is not the only venue. I'll get into the strategies or the tactics in a second. But Giving Tuesday, December 3rd, we have a fundraising goal of a quarter of a million dollars. A quarter of a million dollars is uh, 25 bucks from 10,000 people. A quarter million dollars is 250 people giving a thousand dollars. And the reason that we have that that goal for Giving Tuesday is because we need to basically kickstart the design work and the infrastructure for 2020, because the first set of elections coming up right after the caucuses in in Iowa or New Hampshire, and then we run like hell all the way through September with primaries. There's probably going to be 250, 260 libraries around the country on ballots. And there's going to be uh, every member of the House of Representatives. There are 37 states that are electing state legislators. There are school boards all over the place. They're going to determine the future of school libraries in their communities. We've got about a $2.5 million campaign ahead of us, and we, we're looking at funding fundraising for it. Um, I'm not making an ask of any of the library commissions or state libraries because it's out of, out of zone, but everybody else, I want to I have people throw in on this, you know. What we're going to do with it, though, is multi-channel, utilizing what we already know. We've grown from zero people to 342,000 people on Facebook, zero people to 155,000 people in our database using these techniques that are digital and email focused, asking people to take actions and not simply put up a poster above the drinking fountain. Let's actually take a step to put our deeply held beliefs and our value system to work. Let's pledge to support. Let's actually take that action. We're going to be using phone campaigning as well, and everybody hates telemarketing unless it's a call that you want to get. We're going to be working on environmentals, which means the billboards and other signage. Each of the different regions of the country is going to have different aspects to Libraries 2020 because the way that you fund libraries in California is different than how you do it in Georgia. The way that you fund libraries in Nebraska is different than you do it in Florida or Illinois or Ohio, for that matter. And yet, there's a conversation that needs to be had with the voters, those people who, who care. So the environmentals, paid and earned media, direct mail, and then the big one is also going to be doing a page out of, well, Trump 2020, Warren 2020, Buttigieg 2020, uh, out of the Greenpeace playbook, out of the, the Human Rights Campaign playbook, the, the canvassing. What we're doing right now in England, where folks are going door to door to talk about libraries, where folks are, are posted up on the corner outside of the uh, New York or San Diego Comic Con, signing people up. Hey, do you have a library card? You're a, you're a, you're a gamer nerd. You must love libraries. Oh my gosh, you do. That's fantastic. Let's take an action in support of those. That sort of approach, which is both digital and real world, costs money, but it bears fruit. And what it does most firmly is it allows, it allows well, the industry to have a bench. There are so many different times when there's a crisis and people, well, librarians come to us and say, we need your help. And we have to start from scratch. There's nobody in town. They may be 5, 10, 20 members of the friends group. There's nobody in town. Well, what if we could get 3 to 5% of the American public together to be in your town and your town and your town and all those little spots on the map? We had a great thing happen a couple of months ago when uh, the folks in Oakland, California were running a ballot measure for the library. And we were able to, to, to run, um, based on the work we'd done in and around Oakland for several years before their, their campaign, we were able to run the database and say, how many folks do we have who live in Oakland? And how many folks who've donated before? How many folks have volunteered through every library before? We had 600 people on our database. It gave them a nice jump start. 
for their campaign. And that's a big city. But to also have 10 or 15 people in the greater, well, kind of Rockford, uh, Beloit, uh, Rockville area, Rockville area in northern Illinois, when they were on the ballot, these are powerful ways to bring people together, to ask them to support libraries, and to put their deeply held value systems to work. I'm excited about it. Our strategy is to build supporters, not to increase awareness. Our, our strategy within Libraries 2020 is to ask people to take an action, an affirmative action, and to build that library party. There's a whole approach to engaging people, to move them from being unaware of what we're up to as an organization, what libraries are doing. They drive by, they see the parking lot's full, and they think everything's fine. They have no idea what it costs. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what librarians do. This letter of engagement, we've done it now in dozens and dozens and dozens of places. And we've been doing it now at scale nationally with additional funding supports and with additional support from the, 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 the library community. We can do it faster and better in Libraries 2020. There's a whole process here. It's, it's, it's huge on how to engage the public, how to engage voters. And it moves through a system where you ask people to be a part of what you're doing, give them an opportunity to operationalize that, ask them to do things that are important to them, like donating or volunteering for a campaign. It's curious to me how we are, we don't take a page out of the, out of the best uh, uh, advocacy groups that are out there. We, we, we tend to look inside libraries as if Greenpeace came up to your front door, knocked on your door and was like, hey, uh, I'm with Greenpeace. Do you like the whales? Yes, you do. Great. Then come with me. We're going to get in a boat together. You and me on the North Atlantic, Krista. We're going to go get in a boat. That's not how it actually works. They're mm -hmm. like, hey, yo, knock on the door, maybe a telephone call, maybe a direct mail piece, maybe a Facebook ad. Mm -hmm. Hey, do you like whales? Great. Then let's let's get engaged about whales. Okay, cool. Uh, how about you donate now and our team of whale savers will go out on the North Atlantic and do something that you can't or won't do. Well, you, you can't because you don't have the time. You won't because you're afraid of the water. But you, you value whales. Mm -hmm. We're doing the same thing here with every library around libraries and librarians. Okay. <clears throat> There's four kinds of supporters that we're trying to engage. Relational are people that already love libraries, are already involved in your circle. We want to get to know them better and kind of bring them together so it's not just the usual suspects. The ideological people, those folks who believe in what we're doing as librarians, we are working on, act well, we've got 342,000 of them that we've already worked on activating. There are people who are averse to crises like liter illiteracy or mm -hmm. um, they're averse to Situations like, you know, not uh, in prison libraries where there's no there's no education. They, they want to know what's up with libraries. They're averse to kids not succeeding on tests because there's no school librarians. We have a comprehensive campaign that we're working on through Libraries 2020, and it all builds out with this digital and real world engagement to collect the data about who people are. What do they believe? How can they become activated for the local? state and nationally our issues we're going to be crossing over with libraries 2020 all three languages of politics in library land we're very very comfortable being progressive in our in our vocabulary um, we have to learn well the political literacy conversation we have to learn about how to talk to conservatives in a, in a vocabulary they understand and to talk to libertarians in a vocabulary they understand as well we're getting better at it and we need your help actually especially if you're disconnected from your own community, you might need our help as well. And then Krista, back to your point about stories. We are not telling patron stories on Libraries 2020. We're telling librarian stories. And we're telling, we help each one of our campaigns with librarian stories uh, at the local level and at the state level too. And the, the two key driver stories are stories of the success that the libraries had and the librarians have had that demonstrate their values. That demonstrate their values because there's other people who share those values. The success story, the I did this, and then the stories of failure as well. Because there are times when the story that we have to tell is about correcting a problem. Stories of failure that demonstrate our integrity are as powerful to people who want to see you succeed because they see you as a proxy for their compassion. 
and then we can get to, to, to the stories about, about people we care about, which is the patron stories, or stories that our decision makers want to hear, like, oh, you love kids, let me tell you a kid story. But we are looking to, in Libraries 2020, elevate those stories of success and to be honest about where communities could fail if the library isn't properly supported. We also are going to be marketing yesterday. It's not advertising to tell somebody I'm sorry, it's not the advertising that goes out and says, story time, 10 a.m., bring your kids. Story time, 10 a.m., bring your kids. There might only be like 30 people in your town who could bring their kids, and only a couple of them are free at 10 a.m. on Thursday. Mm -hmm. What happens when we start telling people what happened yesterday? Yesterday, 30 kids showed up, and we did something amazing for them. We, the librarians, well, Miss Karen did something amazing for them. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about what it would look like if we could do 50 kids or 100 kids. Uh, use FOMO. No, because no. I'm talking to people who are, don't even have kids. What about everybody in town who doesn't have a kid who's like, get off my lawn? Who's like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The library is actually doing something that improves their lives, those kids' lives. And mm -hmm. it actually puts my value system to work, which is about a hand up instead of a hand out. Mm -hmm. I don't care if any more kids show up to that program right now. I don't. All right. So this is us. That's, that's, a, that's a, a drastic thing to say to librarians. <laughs> I know. But you guys can work on, the, you can work on those 30 kids. I'll work on making sure together with you as a partner, of course, making sure that you have the funding you need to do at scale. I think what you said, you know, there's, you know, listening to you, there's like two types of marketing and advertising there is the here's the things we're doing the story time and then there's this what you're talking about and we got that first one down that's mm -hmm. not that's not a problem we've got that figured out we know how to make that work and yeah. i think we become complacent because it is working enough and we're missing out on all of this that if we don't keep up with what you're saying and do it do these things we're gonna not gonna be able to do that what we have been successful when, at when when we see our voter support uh, hovering in the mid 50s. Mm -hmm. like right now in California, like I said before, Idaho, uh, Washington, Oregon, sometimes depends on the, on the ballot measure, the way it's structured. It takes 60%, 66% to pass. You know, if you're not polling at 70, 75%, it's not, it's not a smart idea to go out and, and ask for new money. Um, yeah. A couple weeks ago, uh, beginning in November, we had elections around the country and uh, half of the uh, library elections that failed were for new money. Mm. I mean, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Half of the new money elections failed. That's what I meant to say. So when they were when they were asking to renew their money, sure, it passed. People aren't looking to close the library. Though we had one or two that, that actually had some trouble. But of the ones who were looking for new money to add staff or collections or, or, or capacity, half of them failed. Because we don't talk to folks we don't engage folks about where their money's going to go and more importantly, who's going to spend their money. So this is us here with the, uh, with the campaign on giving Tuesday as well. We, we've got a $25,000 money bomb that we're doing in advance, which is, would be great fun. But if you want to hit libraries 2020, anybody who's out there listening um, mm -hmm. and pledge it ahead of time, we do want to collect some, we, we do want to raise about a quarter of a million dollars to get this thing going. That's the presentation. What's on people's minds. What's on your mind, Krista? Yeah, so um, yeah, the website is out there, libraries2020.org. Um, you can go there right now and I guess call it pre-pledge. Yeah, that's right. Let me uh, leave this slide up then for you. Do we have questions coming in or are we? Yeah, uh, sure. um, if anybody has any questions or comments or thoughts on what uh, John has shared with us, type into the question section. Um, if you want to use your microphone, raise your hand and you can um, make your comment or question that way. Uh, the I mentioned the from awareness to funding that he mentioned. If you do, as he says, just go ahead and Google that phrase. It comes up, and uh, OCLC is nice. They have here's the new one for 2018, but they actually link right back to the, to the 2008 one as well, right on that same main page. So um, it's very easy to do find the same comparison information um, that you. I know some people. Uh, that's a concern. I think some people have all these statistics. How do I? find this and, and get it together and it's very easily out there you just have to do the right yeah 
Googling. Um, and Pew, of course, is something that many of us librarians know about. Hopefully, we've seen it. It's always posted. To, we always share it amongst each other when things come up about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something I had a question about. You had mentioned that uh, you've worked with over the years um, the different partners working with the actual, you know, of course, specific libraries uh, and and cities and um, library association, state library associations. Mm -hmm. uh, have you? Um, I, I wonder if you've worked, tried to work with. And I know you did mention state libraries that it's it's a little different of that um, working with them, but have you have any of them partnered with you? Have you tried to partner with them? Like here in Nebraska, yeah. our state library is as the library commission, but. Um, yeah, what we've done with uh, several state libraries and state library commissions is uh, trainings. So we've been brought in, we just recently uh, in Ohio, I'm sorry, Ohio. Ohio. Ohio uh, we did a, oh. uh, yeah, we did a, 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 a circuit around Iowa with our, our friends from the uh, state library uh, sponsoring us. Uh, we did four sites in four days. We went uh, counterclockwise, no, we went clockwise around <laughs> Iowa. Um, it's a full day. Uh, it's a it's an intensive. Um, mm -hmm. and it's about marketing to build support. Um, yeah. And then there's times also where we do a political literacy training. It depends on how the state library uh, is funding the project. Mm -hmm. um, it takes some money to move us around the country, you know. Um, oh. Yeah. But it's been great fun to be able to partner closely with the state libraries themselves um, on those training needs. And it's an important area of our work, that political literacy and that marketing to both support information. Mm -hmm. um, the state library associations, we tend to work with them on specific requests for uh, legislative or policy issues. And we're supporting a number of them right now. New Jersey, for example, uh, comes to mind where there's a specific um, funding level request in Trenton that NGL NJLA is looking for. We're doing a lot of public engagement around that. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, at the local level, we're, we're working on campaigns right now. I've got maybe 13 or 14 on the ballot, us, uh, 13 or 14 on, on, on 2020 already. I'm probably, we're probably gonna do 20 or 25. Um, likewise, we had about, we had 14 so far this year in 2019. That'll be the end of it though, because we're already way into November. Of course, yeah. there's no election days coming up, but we had 14 um, this year alone. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of, I, I, how big of a staff do you guys have? Well, That's you know, we've got three of us full time. Uh, right. And then we've got a, a great group of interns right now. We do mm -hmm. both, uh, we pay our interns, by the way. Um, nice. we, yeah. We have uh, academic interns and we also uh, from uh, uh, library school pro programs, and then we have um, early career um, interns as well. Folks who are you know, transitioning out of like a poli sci program and mm -hmm. are looking at um, you know their first job in politics. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this would be kind of this. Yeah. For not well, I was gonna say not necessarily for someone in librarianship, but it could be depending on how you want to oh, go that route really? in your career. Sure. Absolutely. We've had we've had some some fantastic interns from uh, uh, Drexel and from uh, Syracuse and from uh, um, Simmons. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been great. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a uh, question. Yeah. How would if, if a community does have a issue an issue that they are struggling with and um, they're not on your radar yet? What's the best way for them? And now we're talking right now about this libraries 2020 thing, but what if just they've got something they need your assistance with? How is the best way to? Well, we are we are very happy uh, to hear from you. I, I'm available um, john.crask at everylibrary.org, info at everylibrary.org. There's a report a threat um, 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 page on every library as well as on our Save School Librarians uh, org site. Um, so it depends if it's public or school, yeah. Yeah, whether it's a public library or school, or school library issue, we're, we're, we're equipped, we're ready. We're interested, and we'll also tell you about whether or not it's possible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see these petitions out there where it's it's just not possible to do something, you know, in, in the current political climate. That you have to work on resetting the, the library's reputation or the organization's reputation, um, and that sometimes is more of a backroom discussion than a, than a big advocacy campaign. About half of our work is a big public-facing advocacy campaign, but half of our work is like coaching, training, and guiding the leadership team within the library to fix the problems behind the scenes. So we're very open to both. 
Yeah, and that's something you mentioned earlier in the presentation. I think about the different um, where opposition from to the libraries might be coming from, and mm -hmm. uh, that and we I I as the library development director here at the Library Commission, one of my things is helping libraries work through those kind of issues sometimes, and the um, small town rural politics mm -hmm. and personal um, personal reasons of not supporting the library is. Sadly, way too common, more common than I ever wanted, would have thought it would be. Yeah, and that's yeah. not necessarily something about getting more money. It's you've got to, you got to, but you said you re rebuild what the library is in the town and bring the community in to help support it. Uh, we've got communities where yes, they say, oh yes, the citizens they they love us. Okay, but you still have your administration working against you. You've got to get those citizens to become the advocates and to speak out for the library to the mayor, the city administrator, whoever it is that is anti-tax, anti doesn't want to spend more money, all of those issues. That's right. That's right. Well, one of the one of the things that I, I think is is a problem in library advocacy training from other organizations is that they that they, they they try and minimize the role of the librarian in the advocacy activities. If you don't have a if you don't have a leader, mm -hmm. if the librarian's not front and center on it, and not as an object, but as a as a as a um, an actor, an agent, um, then really folks don't folks don't come along. You know, and it's important to help support that candidacy that the librarian has. That's a key driver for what we do all the time. I think many times they've been taught that the library, that's the, the job of a library board is to do all that advocacy and the lab, job of the library director is to just run the library. Yeah, I mean, and with the library. They need to be more connected. They need to both be doing, I mean, there's no reason yeah, that they should be working more together on both of those things. I, I concur. You know, the, the pronouns that we should be using in library advocacy are the pronouns I and we. Um, we mm -hmm. tend to use the word library as if it was a pronoun. It's not. Um, the the role it. of the, the, the I and the we, um, best thing that the, the board can do is, is, is use the phrase, let me tell you about my librarians, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that, 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 that my in there, that ownership, ownership. That, uh, Ownership's the wrong word. It's more like the, the, the sense of belonging, you know, that we belong together. Get personal investment into it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we got some good boards that are like that, and it's great when you hear from them. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. All right. I know that we're uh, top of the hour here. Yeah. Yep. No problem. Anybody have any last minute other desperate questions you want to ask of John while we have him here? <laughs> uh, you can type into the question section there. Um, and while we're waiting to see if anyone does, I'm going to pull back presenter control to my Very screen. So um, here, doo -doo -doo. there is the Libraries 2020 website. Oh, thank you. That, yeah, <laughs> that I have up here. So um, this is where you can go to right now. And it does say they're launching on December 3rd. But as you can see, you can pledge to donate um, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, any amount uh, you like there. It got a nice countdown going. And some uh, already got a little bit going. Some people yeah, already got on there. We'd love to get the first $25,000 pledged ahead of time. That'd be fantastic. I guess 10% of the way there. Yeah. So um, take a look at that there and see everything that's going on there. Uh, so the from awareness to funding that I mentioned, I just like I said, I just Googled it. Here is the, the OCLC page, um, the current one. And then here they talk about in 2008, they published it. That's the link right out to the previous one. So you can go ahead and see the comparison and the difference. A decade there. So it doesn't look like anybody has anything desperate they want to ask right now, and that's fine. You guys have the website information, John's email. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you so much, John, for this is great. I'm glad I was able to get you on the show um, to talk about the the new um, program launch for next year, or well, next month we'll say with the yeah. the Giving Day. <laughs> Um, and hopefully we'll, we have some, um, can have you on again to talk about as things progress or other things you guys are doing. I would love to do that. It'd be fun like to, to, to thing. We'd love to work with, you know, the library commission with you guys and doing more, um, advocacy in the state, uh, of Nebraska. Let's do a, let's do a phone call then. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So that will wrap it up for today's show, everyone. Um, and as I said, it has been recorded. And here on our Encompass Live website, there we go is where you'll find the archive uh, probably by the end of the day today, as long as everything cooperates with me, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperates. Um, these are our upcoming shows, but underneath here is the link for your archives and the most recent ones at the top of the page. So we will have a link here, this was last week's, um, to the recording and to, um, I think the presentation slides, um, did you want to post them on here as well or have me link to them somewhere, John? We'll, 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 we'll send them over to you to okay. put them up uh, by the end of the day. All right, we'll have that there. Um, when it is available, when it's all ready, I will send an email out to everyone who attended today and everyone who pre-registered to let you know um, that the recording is available. It also push out onto our Facebook and Twitter, all of our usual places. Uh, while we're here on the archives, I will show you, we do have a search feature here so you can search all of our archives. I mentioned at the beginning of today's show that all the various topics that we cover. You can search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months. Um, that is because Encompass Live is um, premiered in January 2009. So we're over 10 years and all of our shows are archived here. Wow. If you want to scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll get our 2009 shows. So as you're using, viewing the archives, just pay attention to the date when something was originally broadcast. Things may change, websites may change, uh, links might not work anymore, services may no longer exist or have modified, changed since we first broadcast the show. But we are librarians, this, we archive things, and we will, as long as we um, have the ability to do so, we will keep all of our archives out there for you. Mm -hmm. So take a look at our history if you want to see what I was doing 10 years ago. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <Same career>. Yeah. <coughs> or if I didn't, yeah. So so that is where our uh, archives will be. Um, we do have, as I mentioned, our Facebook. I do link to our Facebook page. Here's our Facebook page over here. We push out information as well. Um, here's where I promote to logging into today's show. When our recordings are available, we post up on here. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do um, give us a like over there. And um, you can be notified of things we're doing here eh, three or four times a week, maybe. We're not, you know, we'll bury you in things on Facebook. So that will wrap it up for today. Um, I hope you join us next week. We've got our, our here we have our December shows listed here. We have one more I'm waiting for description on, and you're going to start seeing the January ones pop up as I'm getting things finalized for that. <clears throat> but next week we have Pretty Sweet Tech. This is our monthly tech um, um, focused episode. Uh, Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and she comes on usually the last Wednesday of the month with us to talk about something tech focused. And then um, next week, she's talking about design thinking, how technology is made. So if you want to learn more about that, join us next week for um, Amanda's Pretty Sweet Tech session. And please do sign up for any of our other shows we have coming up um, the rest of this year and in 2020. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, John, for being with, um, with me and with us here this morning. Thank you too. This is great. And hopefully we'll see you another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.